audio description. My name is Rosa Maria. I'm part of Coventry University's uh, Center for Dance Research. There are three of us that are part of the WEAVE team from Coventry. Um, well, four, including Kozer. Um, that's Marie-Louise Crawley, who's in the space as well, and Sarah Watley. Um, feel free to wave. <laughs> um, and yes, I am, as I said, your host, but again, please feel free to come in as and when it feels appropriate. Um, for those who need an audio description, I am wearing a pink top with white spots. I'm sitting in a white chair. I have olive skin tone, dark brown hair that's up, and I'm in front of a burgundy wall. So welcome everyone, and I'd like to welcome the rest of the team, the Weave team, who's part of the lab day. We have Carla and Stefan and Rui and Alex. Hello, welcome Hello. everyone. Hello. Hello. So as mentioned, this is um, an EU project that is co-financed by the European Union under the CEF Connecting Europe, Europe Facility Program. Um, the goal is to enrich Europeana, which we will find out who um, knows a little bit about Europeana and who doesn't in a moment. Um, but this is uh, linked with looking at aggregating content, both tangible and intangible content, um, uh, cultural heritage to Europeana. And also we're developing new tools, which we'll learn about today. A little overview, WEAVE is, stands for Widening European Access to Cultural Communities via Europeana. It's a project that aims to develop a framework to link the tangible and intangible heritage of cultural communities, safeguarding the rich and invaluable cultural heritage which they represent. In particular, the project will aggregate over 5,000 new high-quality records to Europeana and showcase these collections in a set of engaging editorials and a virtual exhibition. The project will carry out several capacity building activities to develop a closer connection between cultural heritage institutions, minority cultural communities, and Europeana. And Alex, who is part of the project managing team, will um, tell us a little bit more in depth about Weave. But before that, I'd like to just a quick poll um, to get a sense of who knows um, about Europeana and who is aware and, and uses 3D modeling. The poll is now up on your screen or should be up on your screen. There are four questions, so please make sure you scroll down. And we'll take about a minute to, to run so that you have a moment to go through that. For those just coming in, 
There is a poll up on your screen. There are four questions. Make sure you scroll down. And 10 more seconds and then we'll end the poll. Not everyone has voted. Okay, I think we'll end the poll. So it looks like, um, are you aware, here are the poll results. Are you aware of your piano? We have some yes and some more no's, okay. Are you familiar with 3D modeling? We have some yes, 72% of you said yes, 28% uh, of you said no. Have you used 3D modeling in your work before? Oh, 39% said yes, and 61 said no. And the last question, in what capacity or context have you used it? Okay, it looks like educational and commercial seem to be uh, at the top. Artistic, okay. All right, thank you. And great, okay. And I will stop sharing that. Okay, so now we have a sense of who's in the space. For those of you that just came into the space, please, I won't repeat everything, um, but please um, use the chat function. Know that this is being recorded. Um, also, the text in the chat is also public, um, but feel free to use it. Feel free to keep your cameras on. And without further ado, I will welcome my colleague, uh, Alex. Alexander Rustan from IN2, who will give us an overview about the Weave project. Hello, Alex, welcome. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex from IN2 Digital Innovations. We um, are an SME uh, from Germany, in fact. <laughs> so hello from Germany as well. And um, let me share my presentation, actually. Give me one second. Um, I have some support slides that usually are quite nice, um, but you still get to see me as well. Um, doo -doo -doo. So, uh, yes, perfect. Um, so I am representing IN2, who is coordinating this uh, WIP project. Um, what we do, we are working at the intersection of, in a way, AI and user interfaces and DevOps. And um, actually, we went to improve how um, digital content can be accessed by everyone. And this is how we um, got to Weave. <laughs> so um, you already heard from Rosa what Weave stands for. It's, um, let's say, a long, interesting name. But um, OK, you might be asking probably also from the um, results of the poll, what is um, what is Europana, actually? So um, let me start by maybe explaining this a bit. Um, Europana is an initiative from the European Union. It was started in 2008 and supported by the Commission since then. Um, it's um, um, an organization that imagines a cultural heritage sector, which is powered by digital, and um, it imagines Europe being powered by culture. Um, it aims to support the resilient and growing economy and uh, looking to increase employment, improve well-being, and give a sense of European identity. And um, the motto, in a way, is access um, um, for all, participating with digital culture. And the core of this is the Europana website, uh, which provides a gateway to basically uh, over 50 million records of cultural heritage objects, uh, which has been digitized. Um, over um, almost half of those actually um, um, can be freely reused and over um, two thirds of those um, have some sort of uh, reuse um, availability actually. So it's not only, let's say, fascinating and interesting to browse through the Europana uh, site, but also you can uh, think of how that content can be um, reused in some of the projects that you are working on, basically. Okay, so um, now that we know a bit what uh, Europana is, you you might be wondering, okay, so 
why is with um, targeting cultural communities? Um, well, let's say if we go back a couple of years ago when um, the Notre Dame was on fire, it <laughs> it became very clear how um, to everyone actually how um, how um, sensitive and how and in what kind of a perishable nature this iconic monuments um, cultural heritage in Europe they they have and um, of course then the the focus was very much on um, tangible cultural heritage um, but in fact if uh, we uh, look a bit deeper into the issue of cultural heritage at risk we see that actually it is intangible cultural heritage and especially that belonging to communities um, which are often marginalized which is more at risk than ever before actually so um, this is in fact what uh, triggered the the, the project uh, we've um, so um, um, let's go now a bit into the details of um, what the um, um, goals of the project are well um, what we want to do is, is to develop a framework for linking and presenting these connections between the tangible and intangible heritage um, of the cultural um, um, communities and um, bringing these communities also to the center of attention, making them accessible in Europana because they have not been um, really accessible um, in the past. Um, and as already Rosa has mentioned, there are a couple of pillars to this approach. One of them is the aggregation of new content to Europana. Here on the right, you see some uh, nice photo of the, of the Castellar um, community in Girona. Um, the focus of today will be 3D objects and 3D contents, but we in the project will also deal with videos and with photographs. Another um, pillar of the project is the WIF toolkit. Um, this is made up of several tools to facilitate this kind of um, work. Um, very relevant to today are the first two, um, the WIF 3D Asset Manager. Um, this is being developed by the colleagues uh, from Arctur, from, from Slovenia, and it is uh, meant for storing large, high-quality 3D assets, um, viewing and manipulating the 3D models and point clouds, actually, um, all of this in a web browser. Um, another very important tool and uh, that you will see in more detail today is Motion Notes. Um, this is developed by the colleagues in Portugal at the new University of Lisbon. And this is an annotation tool, an annotation of movements, which um, includes semi-automatic recognition of specific gestures um, and movements uh, within the space of, of a given performance. Um, you won't hear about this today, but maybe just to let you know, um, two other tools are part of the toolkit. One is the Wave Experience. Um, it is a tool for managing Europana content of different types, including 3D allowing users to basically capture um, content from the Europana portal into their own space where they can manage it, uh, curate it, and um, um, create uh, stories, collections, or experiences, as we call it. Um, and another tool um, relates to automatic enrichment of um, metadata, um, especially relevant for um, the content which we plan to aggregate. Uh, so that uh, more metadata is available to the content, which will make it much easier to uh, find and discover on the Europana portal. Um, we are part of this kind of an experience of a lab day. This is um, a very nice format that um, uh, the colleagues at Coventry have developed over the course of uh, several years, actually. Um, it is meant to provide uh, an engaging atmosphere and to discuss specific topics with an audience like um, yourself. So I hope that you will have a very good um, event today. Uh, these are some images, um, what would happen actually when this is uh, physical and not digital. <laughs> um, the last point that I want to say is that uh, WIV is a collaboration between um, 12 partners all throughout Europe. Um, 
you find on our website a bit more information on uh, the project the, uh, or different partners. I will say that indeed there, there are very different profiles from technology partners, universities, um, um, content owners, um, communities. So um, they all come together and um, they try to weave their uh, know-how. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I will give the floor now to um, Rosa back, I think. And of course, I will remain here for any questions that you might have. Yes, thank you, Alex. Thank you for that lovely presentation and giving us an overview of Weave, the project, the partners, the content, and also some of the visuals. I think um, the visuals show uh, many of the communities where um, that are part of the, the project in, in various ways, um, but also showing the contents that we're, we're working with and that we are exploring. Um, and as you said, Alex, this is a lab day, and indeed it's not physical, it's digital. Um, but this lab day framework is underpinned by communicative methodology, which is a sociological method that aims to cross social, cultural, and linguistic boundaries. Um, this framework enables us to open an egalitarian dialogue between various um, people, participants, academics, researchers, artists, and the hope is that we bring people together from various profiles um, to look at whether it's a problem or a need or a gap and think about not only what is um, why that gap exists or what that, let's say, problem is, but how, what are some of the solutions or how can technology or various um, tools, people, expertise come together to think about how we, we approach and, and maybe start to make some changes. Um, and so having done that, in this context, we're looking at 3D modeling um, in cultural communities and um, tangible and intangible cultural heritage. Some people have already commented on the Padlet, and so I will drop that link into the chat. Um, but those are some of the questions that we've been thinking about ourselves within the, the team, but also want, wanting to engage you to offer us some, some support and so that we, it can be a real um, exchange of knowledge and, and that we can support each other as we go um, through this, so that we're not existing in silos and that we really come together. Um, and now coming together, I offer the floor to Mateusz, who is our partner from Oktur, who is located in Slovenia. Thank you, uh, Mateusz. Welcome. Good morning. And the floor Hello. is Hello. Hi, hi. So, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear I you. I assume you, you do. You. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So, I'm Mateusz, Mateusz Strauss from Slovenia, from company Arctur. Uh, we are uh, a supercomputer company um, from the west of Slovenia on the border with Italy. Um, and uh, the company itself has a long tradition of working at the, um, at the front of uh, technological development. We are most known for our supercomputer services. And coming from these, that field, uh, having the knowledge about the, uh, what we call today Industry 4.0, um, we uh, it was uh, maybe four or five years ago that uh, we uh, decided that we want to um, to to uh, move from uh, or to to use these technologies and the knowledge about these new technologies that we have um, and to adapt it to the fields of tourism and cultural heritage. Um, here, uh, especially because these two fields um, are um, in lack uh, of the knowledge about these uh, technologies, uh, and we felt that we can uh, contribute here. Um, our approach to uh, tourism and cultural heritage uh, is, um, uh, is very much centered around the local communities and that whatever we do uh, needs to uh, foster the development of local communities and should be in line with what local communities want. Um, so development of tourism uh, should bring positive impacts in local communities and uh, reduce or uh, we try to reduce the negative impacts that tourism and uh, 
especially tourism of, on cult cultural heritage sites um, gives. So uh, here at the screen you see um, uh, uh, this is a map of Slovenia. We call it a section of Slovenia um, with these little dots. And these little dots are immovable cultural heritage uh, in Slovenia. So quite a lot of them. Um, each of these dots has its own story and its own uh, reason why uh, it was uh, put onto, onto this, uh, this map of immovable cultural heritage. But most of these elements, uh, of most of these units is not known to public. It's not a touristic site. It's not, its story is not told. Um, and uh, we believe that in each of these dots there lies the potential for a story to be told. Uh, even for a tourist uh, product to be developed. Uh, and of course, when I say a tourist product, it does not mean uh, masses of tourists. Uh, it could be for local tourists, it could be for local communities. So uh, what I mean here is that the, the, the site is, uh, that, that this uh, cultural heritage is interpreted to other uh, visitors. Um, and we believe that digital technologies can be of help here. Uh, so can be of help here in transforming these little dots, the potential of these little dots uh, into stories that are told, um, especially because uh, the digital layer um, is an additional layer of information uh, that can be uh, textual, graphical, um, audio, uh, layer of information that um, adds something to the physical um, that is out there uh, in the, uh, in, in the, on the terrain. Um, and here, of course, I'm talking mostly about immovable cultural heritage. Something similar, uh, of course, uh, is, is, is true for the movable cultural heritage. Um, so um, this, this is one of the reasons why uh, digitizing cultural heritage um, is, is, a good, uh, is a good thing and, and we should do it. So, and so, as I said, we can attract new audiences. We, of course, preserve cultural heritage in a digital format uh, by creating new, uh, new, interpretation, new interpretation tools of cultural heritage, we can uh, manage tourist flows or we can uh, shift uh, tourists and visitors to go to other places. And of course, all these uh, activities offer new opportunities for creative industries. Um, as a consequence of all these things, of course, we see that um, an ecosystem is, is developing and something similar is going on now in Slovenia. Uh, new uh, skills, new skill sets are being developed that bridge the gaps between technology interpretation um, and, uh, and preservation. Uh, of course, new collaborations are emerging, which at the end results in uh, multiplier effects that are outside of tourism and outside of uh, technology, so that have much broader Impact. But today I want to uh, show you some projects that we are working on that are dealing with 3D modeling as we, uh, as the topic of the today's lab day is. Um, so uh, most of the cases that I'll be presenting are our cases that we are currently working on. Some of them are also, also um, such as the, the, these uh, images on the left side of the screen are, are, are taken from the, from the internet. Um, but uh, um, also in the chat, feel free to ask questions and I'll, afterwards I'm, I'm happy to answer some of the questions. So I, I would first like to start by pointing to uh, this big difference that we see that is still not so, so much understood, is so the difference between a 360 degree photo or 360 degree video and a 3D model. Um, and I think that this left image it shows it quite clearly and in, in the uh, following slides I'll be I'll, I'll try to stress uh, this difference that is quite important for uh, the tools that we want to develop further on. Um, so a 3D model is actual uh, a model in a 3D space while uh, 360 degree video or photography uh, is still a 2D two-dimensional um, two-dimensional image. Um, and of course, then the, the differences are uh, resulting from that. Um, 
and uh, I'll try to point it differently later on. Uh, so we, um, when we do the 3D model, 3D models of immovable cultural heritage, uh, we are mostly using uh, laser scanning and photogrammetry. These are the two tools that we use the most. Uh, and then uh, these are followed by uh, 3D modeling that I'll also show some examples. Um, and of course, uh, sonar as, as one option that is used quite uh, rarely. Um, so when we talk about digitally capturing 3D, uh, 3D objects, we have, as said before, different, uh, different approaches to it. And the size of the, uh, the object that we want to uh, capture um, basically defines the tool or the approach, to the technology that we want to use to capture it. So in our case, we mostly, as I said, use photogrammetry. Uh, this is aerial photogrammetry. We mostly use it because the buildings are uh, the buildings that we are capturing um, are quite large and especially inaccessible um, on higher grounds or on higher levels. Um, I maybe just to point out that uh, each digital capture of uh, uh, immovable cultural heritage uh, in the nature is subject to many, many uh, conditions and um, either it be legal uh, or um, related to, to the weather, uh, the security, and of course the technology, especially uh, thinking of how do we, um, how do we um, edit or how do we um, yeah, edit the, the data that we gathered on the field. Um, so the basic principle uh, is, is as follows. So this is an example of uh, digital capturing of 3D uh, objects um, using either photogrammetry uh, or laser scanning with photogrammetry. So basically at the beginning, we start by capturing the building in the field. Uh, if we use uh, photogrammetry, this is then done by uh, cameras. Uh, so we take lots of lots of images of a certain building um, that is uh, later on. Uh, these images are, of course, um, overlapping to a certain degree. Uh, for example, it would be around 80% uh, overlap. So each image is basically an overlap of the previous image um, in 80%, but uh, resulting in let's say 8,000 images of a building taken from all sides uh, of a building that is uh, later on in a special uh, software uh, that could be uh, Metashape, uh, Metashape, I guess of Metashape uh, software or reality capture uh, software or any other similar uh, software. Um, these data is, this, in, these images are processed uh, into a point cloud. So point cloud is uh, a cloud uh, of points in a 3D space. Um, still here we are talking just about dots uh, in a space uh, that needs to be connected with each other later on creating a, a 3D model, solid 3D model. Um, and later on we put onto that a texture that adds uh, this realistic view uh, of the building itself. So now this is for the case of photogrammetry, the photogrammetric um, capture of 3D models. Um, if we use laser scanning, um, the laser uh, scanner creates a point cloud already by itself. So we don't need this special software and we don't need to take these images. Um, but still um, using photogrammetry is still advisable in combination with uh, laser scanning, because uh, by that we can create uh, quality textures that we cannot get from uh, just by uh, creating, uh, just by uh, laser scanning of the building. So maybe just to show you some examples that we've worked on. Um, so here in, in this uh, top uh, middle image, we see these uh, blue uh, squares, these 
symbolize the images that were taking the positions of the images that were taking um, of the of that building the the dots that we see are the markers that are uh, measured uh, uh, geodetically measured uh, dots so that we know exactly in nature where uh, in the space these dots are um, and that then we can digit in the digital model replicate the uh, um, relationships between these dots uh, so that they uh, are the same as in the nature. Uh, maybe some uh, images from the field. Uh, here you see some, some images that we, uh, how this is done using, uh, mostly using drones, but also hand cameras um, and creating uh, the plans of uh, flights, uh, the manual plans of flights or automatic. Uh, plans of flights. Here I can. Here I have a, a point cloud, um, for example, that is then developed. Uh, this is unfiltered point cloud. Here again, you see the locations of the images that we're taking um, of that church. This is a church above uh, Kamnik town in the central Slovenia. Uh, similarly, similar uh, results of a point cloud we get using uh, laser scanning. Um, this is, for example, different shots uh, of uh, capturing a, a Hallstatt period um, remains of a building from a Hallstatt period. As I said, from a point cloud, we move to a 3D model. Um, so the dots are linked together and then wrapped with a texture. And here we have an image of a 3D model of a building in uh, south central uh, Slovenia. And you can see that basically the, the more images that we have, the more uh, markers that are measured. Uh, the markers are here you see on the, uh, on the walls. The more we have, the more detailed the model is, uh, and of course, the more realistic uh, it looks like. Um, so this here, here we have some examples of a project that we did uh, in the previous years. Uh, just some, so the the differences in uh, what can be uh, captured are really, really different. Each has its own specificities. Uh, if a building is a, is small, it does not mean that it's uh, also simple uh, to digitally capture. Uh, basically, the complexity of a building defines also the complexity of um, complexity of digital capture. So once we have a, a 3D model of a building, we can then move to uh, 3D modeling um, or reconstructing. Uh, uh, parts of a building or parts of an area that do not exist uh, in the nature um, at the moment. Here, an example from a castle in the west of Slovenia, where we reconstructed a, a part uh, of a castle that was um, burned down in the Second World War. Um, here we have a Hallstatt house. So this is a, a reconstruction of a building built on top of a, on top of a, um, foundations that are still present in the in the in nature, um, so the basically this reconstruction fits uh, the, the nature uh, one hundred percent, and only by that uh, I think that many people can imagine how did the building actually look like. Um, here I have an image of a furnace. We're dating furnace from a mercury mine uh, in Idria, uh, where uh, basically the, uh, we reconstructed the whole furnace with its technical um, elements, um, trying to then showcase how did the furnace work and how did it uh, uh, smell the ore. More images from a castle. Uh, here, still nothing remains. One factory 
nowadays only a small part of the building here on the left side uh, exists. Um, and this, once we have, for example, a 3D model and then a reconstructed 3D, um, 3D uh, building or 3D uh, object, uh, we should start thinking about how do we present this to a wider audience. So um, just showing them a 3D model, of course, can be interesting, but um, it does not really interpret the cultural heritage. Um, and uh, it really does not uh, does not uh, does not solve uh, the, the, the whole uh, problem of interpretation. So here we believe that we should uh, combine technology with storytelling skills, of course, expertise, uh, and this sustainable approach to, to developing the tools. And we can uh, we have quite a few media, new media that we can use in this digital interpretation of cultural heritage. Um, that I believe some of them are quite uh, are known to you and are well used, and some of them uh, maybe not so much. Maybe just here to stress that the use of uh, the, the media uh, is dependent on, on several factors of who do we want to uh, who do we want to interpret this cultural heritage to, uh, what kind of uh, experience we want to create, um, and of course what the duration it would be. So here, maybe I, for the end, I just show some examples. Um, one thing that we did was in, uh, in the south uh, east part of Slovenia, in, in Osavia, where we have uh, several castles um, in this region. We've 3D scanned all of the castles uh, in that uh, region. Um, so this here, we have a 3D model uh, of the castle and created uh, a wireframe of the castle uh, with different interpretation uh, images. Uh, and then all these were put uh, into a digital room that was um, set up uh, in the spa resort uh, in that area. Um, I'll show you uh, some video from the, that area. From the from the room. So basically, in the room we have holograms, we have VR goggles through which users can move to this these different castles. And we have videos um, and all supported with uh, textual explanation of what basically the visitors are viewing. Another example is uh, the example of um, archaeological oh site. I'm sorry. Is, can we have one minute, please? Yeah, I'll finish in one minute and I'll finish with a, a video. Um, so an example from Simonoza Liv, this is on the coast of Slovenia, where we reconstructed a, a Roman villa. Uh, basically, nowadays, not much remains. Um, and I'll just finish with this video of how we reconstructed this uh, villa. It's a short video. Yeah, I'll finish it here. Um, so I would like to thank everyone for listening. I have so much material that then it's just uh, hard to stop. I know. Uh, but I know. I'll be sorry, happy. I have to be the one to yeah, stop yeah. you. Um, but um, we have... If there are some questions, I'll be happy to answer them in the chat later on. Otherwise, I leave the floor to uh, Rosa.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you Mateusz. Thank you. And, you know, it's very interesting. And I know I have the, the, the hard job <laughs> of having to stop just when we were yeah. getting into the, the meaty bits, but hopefully we can come back. Um, and as Mateusz has been taking us on this uh, adventure, having a really kind of top words <laughs> eye view to castles and things that are quite um, static. We're now going to move into another perspective of looking at um, 3D modeling in terms of the body. So something that moves quite a lot and that is in constant motion. And to do that, I give the floor to my colleagues um, from Portugal, from UNL, uh, Carla, Rui and Stefan. Hello, welcome. Thank Hello. you. Hello. Hello. So Carla, over to you. Thank you very much, Rosa. Uh, well, again, good morning, everyone. And I'm really, really happy to be here. I'm, I'm afraid I didn't prepare a long introduction, introduction about our university in Lisbon. Um, as Mateo was doing it, it made me think. But I, I only have five minutes now to introduce what my colleagues Stefan and Rui will then be demonstrating um, in practical terms. Um, first of all, um, if you need an audio description, I, I will just um, tell you that I am um, a woman. I'm Portuguese, based in Lisbon, working at the New University of Lisbon, um, and uh, I am dark blonde, 55 years old, wearing a green top. Um, so, uh, yeah, Nova University is um, actually Nova because it means new in Portuguese. It's an university that is a counterpoint to the classical universities in Portugal because this was just built and established uh, after the, well, actually in the year of the revolution when we didn't have a dictatorship anymore. So in 74 and um, 75 then. And um, it's actually the the second largest in Portugal in, in, um, in the group of public universities. So what I'll uh, be uh, just wanting to share with you mostly now is that um, the, um, the knowledge we have gained in um, video annotations for intangible cultural heritage comes from uh, many years ago when um, I started looking at um, interactions in terms of um, body language, so nonverbal language, in creativity settings, namely during uh, choreographic rehearsals. So I have a very long um, interest in dance. And uh, we started to realize that we needed to do some or develop from scratch actually we did the first prototype already in uh, in 2007 uh, of a video annotator that was at the time called creation tool and that was the very beginning of the tool that we will be presenting on today which is motion notes in the framework of this with project uh, actually this long story came from just the experience with a choreographer, very contemporary one, uh, very known actually now in Europe, Rui Horta in Portugal. And uh, I basically was interested in analyzing how he communicated to the dancers and also, of course, to um, especially the ones that had never worked with him. And we felt the need of having tools to assist, to assist um, choreography, uh, re choreographic rehearsals and note taking. So what we did was the beginning uh, of a video annotator called Creation Tool at that time. And then we uh, got together with a group of uh, already um, Rosa and, and, and Alex in the Europeana uh, Space uh, Project. And we did another iteration of it, which was uh, still called Dance Pro. And now finally with motion notes, we have um, a web-based annotator. And I'll just uh, show you very, in some seconds, just some uh, examples, not of the, of the, um, of course, motion notes, which will be thoroughly demonstrated now afterwards by Rui, uh, but just to situate you that indeed, uh, note-taking in video is really useful for intangible 
cultural heritage as well. So normally we tend to think that we need 3D models basically for objects, for tangible heritage. And in this case, in my projects throughout the last, yeah, already 15 years, we've always been dealing with intangible cultural heritage with a strong focus in dance. So previously we were working with contemporary dance and now in this SWIFT project, we are working with traditional dances of Portugal with our partners, Ped uh, Shumbu, who are providing the content of several um, films and um, very well-documented traditional dances in risk of loss in some cases in, uh, in Portugal and some others being recreated um, already with the help of digital tools. So just so that you imagine a little bit why taking notes, I'll just show you very short examples, one of them from contemporary dance. So when people are trying to learn a movement and then they need to understand also the terminology that the choreographer uses, in this case, self-dodge, Sylvia Heimer. So you do the, then there's the stop, you see the movement and the annotations lead you to the focal points, I'll repeat, to the focal points of, um, of, the, of the movement. So, so in, indeed you, you just, um, you are led to the, the specific body parts and specific nuances that one needs to really learn, uh, in that case, the specific vocabulary of, um, of this choreographer, Sylvia Heimer. And just to finish before they start, so I'm just finishing. So this, was, this is the example I, I was just talking now um, about uh, taking notes in a 3D environments, again, to correct postures and to um, take notes around, in, uh, around the bodies while they are moving in the video and in the point clouds in this case. I don't know if you actually saw the, um, the, the, the video before, did you, Rosa? Because I had this interruption here with the with the re recording of the session. No, we didn't see the video, Carla. Yeah, thank you. So I'll re I don't know what happened. So I will. Can you see it now? No, we we'll see the slideshow. Oh my god! Well, uh, it's really weird because it was working so well. So again, sorry, I think it stopped when I was interrupted for the recording. Uh, well, again, so you see the video here, the little example that you need to learn, and then the, the note taking these red circles, for example, it could be drawings, it could be text, whatever we used in this case, just the, the red the circles to indicate the specific body parts. Uh, so now um, I will stop uh, sharing my screen and I will in, uh, sorry, this is now, okay. Uh. <laughs> I'm not sharing anymore, am I? No, it's okay. It's okay, Carl. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, so now we will carry on uh, describing uh, what we've done for motion notes and giving a, a little demo and also the developments, the most current ones that we are doing towards implementing also through integrating 3D models in the tool. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just give me a minute to... Mm. This mm. some technical problem here. I'm not able to <laughs> share my second monitor for some reason. Are you seeing my the motion notes landing page? Yes, now now we're seeing it. Why? Okay, okay, okay. So yes. I will start. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, again. <laughs> My name is Rui Rodrigues. I am a PhD student at Nova University of Lisbon. I also teach computer science courses, and recently I joined this WAVE project. 
Well, today I'm presenting these two, the Motion Notes. Uh, Motion Notes is a multimodal web based video annotator created in 2019, this last version, as Carlos said before. It was developed in each HTML and JavaScript all web technologies, standard web technologies. Um, and with this WAVE project, we are now developing new features, um, mainly regarding 3D modeling and human pose estimation to be integrated in motion nodes, okay? Um, so I will present right now the current version, which was the starting point uh, for these new developments. Afterwards, my colleague Stefan will show you the the prototypes about the motion nodes 3D in our objectives, just to better understanding what we are working on. Okay. Uh, so this is the motion nodes landing page. Um, the first time uh, users will need to just to create an account and uh, re re register yourself with the usual data, uh, the name, email, password, and then you are able to log in into into uh, the motion nodes uh, main work area. So let's look at the, this, these menus and buttons. Um, up here, we have the traditional uh, menus, the file menu to import videos, to stream videos for, from YouTube. It's also possible uh, to select different videos in your area. Edit menu to copy paste annotations, view to customize the, um, your workplace. Um, the settings, it's basically to change resolutions, choose between different devices. In the help menus, we have um, several tutorials to help work with this tool. Uh, here on the left, we have the annotation triggers. It's possible to draw uh, over the video, to add text over the video, also to add audio comments um, to, the, to a specific frame on the video. Uh, it's possible to add URLs to different uh, web pages to detail something that is happening in the video, or for instance, and the marks annotation that are a special type that we created. Uh, it, it was designed to be very fast and flexible, mainly to annotate while we are recording something and we don't want to highlight some uh, particular uh, moment. Okay. Uh, in the right, it's all about the annotations properties. You can change color, line style. You also can copy and re remove annotations. Under the video area, we have the traditional playback controls with the timeline, volume. And at the bottom, we have the annotation tracks. The annotation tracks are visual temporal um, tool um, to provide uh, information about all the annotations contained in the video. Okay, so let's uh, do a short demonstration. I will import a video from our colleagues, um, partners in this project, Ped Shumbu. Uh, okay, I imported the video to our servers and then I will start playing the video. Uh, here, the objective here in this scene is to to add an annotation highlighting the synchronization between this man and this woman. Okay, so to highlight this synchronization, uh, to improve the synchronization, we can do something like I don't know, draw something around here. Okay, and then add uh, some text uh, like that. Okay, and then just to exemplify, we can add here uh, URLs. Okay. It's also possible to change this color. Okay, and then I will show you the, the marks annotation. Um, at the first time, we need to do a little setup just to, to show that we need to select an icon 
select the color blue and add some descriptive text okay create and then we are able to, to use the mark in all of our videos okay i will just add a key moment right here okay as you can see the representation down here it it was it is helpful and also we can change the start time it can uh, the duration is all cost, also customizable okay um and then let's see how it looks okay something like that it's a small example that what we can do with this annotator um we can do this kind of things while recording if you connect the camera to your computer it's possible to record and add annotations at the same time as well and i think it's more or less everything i like the basics of this annotator so i regarding the new developments that are occurring right now uh, we already finished the development of the mechanism that enables uh, to manage 3d models we will head to this interface the 3d models um it's possible to upload new models to update the models to remove them um it's in testing in software testing right now phase uh currently we are developing the browser 3d visualizer to integrate here also in motion nodes and we also worked in the framework to deal with cameras rotation drag and drop of uh, 3d models regarding the position um and this will be integrated soon. We are planning to release a new version in about seven weeks, more or less. Um, very well, I will um, give the floor to my colleague, Stefan. He will uh, present the prototypes. So, Stefan. And yes, if, if I may, Rosa, just because I, I should have introduced Stefan as well when I can. Yeah? Yes, yes, of course. Sorry. Now, just to say that after Rui, now Stefan, they, they both work, for, of course, for us for the same um, university, Nova, in different faculties. I am with Stefan at the Faculty of Science and Technology, uh, sorry, ah, Social Sciences and Humanities. These acronyms are terrible. And uh, Rui is at the Faculty of Science and Technology. And um, and uh, yeah, Stefan will now present the 3D models that will then later on, during the duration of the pro project, be integrated in these motion nodes annotated that you've just seen. Okay. Yeah. Hello to uh, everyone this morning. Thank you for your interest and being here. Uh, very briefly about myself, I've been in my first life, <laughs> I've been a dancer and then got into the intersection with uh, choreography and new media technologies. Meanwhile, I have a lot of work as a video designer to create interactive systems and so on for the stage. Um, I've been with Carla for so many years, uh, researching together on different projects. And so I was, was involved in uh, the creation tool, the pro dance, and now in the motion notes. I'm really happy to be here and to show you sort of a brainstorming type of uh, video, which I've prepared for you because um, otherwise I would have to have many different so software applications open and maybe that would be too much for this meeting. So let's see the video and get an overview about 3D functionalities in motion nodes that we're preparing right now and that should be ready in the November version that uh, Hui was just talking about. Okay, so I'll share the video with you. Um, hold on. Hi, what I will show here are prototypes of 3D functionalities for motion nodes. The interface will obviously be very different. The buttons and sliders here only serve to visualize ideas. For example, we could use a mid-size 3D object as a floor or stage and change the textures according to interior or exterior spaces.
Let's go with the wooden floor of a dance studio. Evidently, the user will be able to position, resize and navigate the 3D objects. Two D media, such as this video of a Portuguese traditional dance by our partners from Pedeshombo, can be used, imported as a layer of a three D object. In this case, a simple plane. This way, the video can be positioned, resized, and manipulated as a three D object. Now let's use a small scale three D object as a notation. Musical instruments might be a good idea in this context of the traditional Portuguese dance video. As we can see here, the different 3D objects can be grouped and positioned, resized and navigated together. Another idea is to use a 2D file, such as an image, as a background and combine it with a 3D object for annotation. The flute we saw before in the 3D environment now is superimposed on a separate layer and can be manipulated independently. A third possibility is the use of 360 degree video. Here we see dancers from the Portuguese National Ballet in a new production by choreographer Rui Lopes Graça. In this particular case, the motion graphics you see are not annotations and motion notes, but part of the video production realized by Carla Fernandes, myself and Roger Oliveira during the Black Box research project. As we can see here, the 360 degree video can be navigated by zooming in, panning around, etc. A fourth possibility is to embed a screen capture functionality in motion nodes so that any web content or local files can be visualized. In this case, a 3D file from Arctur, our partners here in the Weave project. Again, this video layer can be combined with other content, for example, the musical instruments that we have seen before. Moving on, we will have a look at the second prototype. Here we see a proxy version of the cultural heritage 3D example model provided by Arctur and combine it with different smaller scale 3D objects to get an idea how we could annotate in a 3D environment in motion nodes in the near future. Here I am navigating the 3D model in Blender to look for a place where I can insert our Portuguese traditional dance model examples. Once I make my decision, I add the stage, the video screen and the musical instrument. Finally, I start the playback of the video file. This is what we can share at this moment with you. Thank you for your interest. We are looking forward to your questions, comments and other feedback.
Yeah, so that's it. Uh, thank you. I'll uh, turn back to Rosa. Thank you. Thank you, Carla, Rui, and Stefan. Um, wow. So we've seen two different ways to use technology for um, this um i'm still seeing i'm seeing myself on screen is there is there a spotlight on me and the screen share as well is that happening or is it just uh i only see you rosa you only see one of me okay then it's just my <laughs> i'm seeing double <laughs> um no thank you so much for for that presentation and for also um combining the 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 castle and and the you know the art tours work with your example because i think it's starting to show us what's possible and if we've learned anything in this last year of being stuck in our homes and not being able to travel or go into theater spaces um this seems like a really you know the potentiality there is quite exciting and um at this point i think we will have a short poll just to see just a little moment to to take a breather um, and then we'll move into the Q&A because I'm sure people have some questions for us but if we can have the second poll closer that'd be great um, there are a few questions I'm asking you to please use your chat function for some of the the replies um, take a minute to to allow you to answer and to just have a bit of a breather. The first question is what else would you like to see done with 3D modeling? Please use the chat to give your answer. The second question is Will you now consider this technology for working with dance or other forms of intangible cultural heritage? The third question is, would you be interested in paying for the 3D printed version of the 3D model? And the last question, which price seems fairly reasonable? We are not selling anything, but we just wanted to get a sense of, um, you know, this this market, uh, you know, value and, and, and just kind of see because we have various people in the space with that who come from that background. So we also just wanted to to see um, and engage those individuals in the space as well. Um, great, so we can end this poll and the results. Can people see the results? I hope so. We see that 73% would say that they would like, um, oh, have used the chat to do that. Um, would you now consider this technology for working? 100% said yes. Um, three, would you be interested in paying 55 for, ooh, half and half there said yes, that they would. And question four, what would be the fee that people have used the chat? So thank you for that. And now we move into the question and answer. As I've said and put in the chat throughout the, the, um, the, the day, we have a Padlet. I will put that Padlet into that link into the chat. Again, feel free to use that, but we're already seeing some replies there. Um, but I, I would like to offer anyone the opportunity to ask a question now, if they'd like to, or any, you know, and our colleagues, please feel free to ask one another questions as well, because um, we have some Weave team members in the space as well. So feel free at this point also to turn on your cameras um, and, you know, wave, say hi, if you, if you want, please be mindful. We are recording and this is, um, that might, that recording might be made public. So hello, good morning, everyone. Or good afternoon for some colleagues in some spaces. If you have a question, feel free to raise your hand because I can't see everyone all the time in the same space. Am I missing someone who's raising a hand? 
I invite my colleagues. Any questions? Um, there are those, it seems, a couple of questions on the chat, if I saw correctly. Okay. Um, okay. Maybe it's interesting to um, uh, see those. Okay. Let me try and find those, or maybe Marie Louise had um, those. At 11.54, I see one, if I could read it. Is yes. Okay. Perfect. So, um, there was a question on 3D reconstruction and how much is based on known facts and how much is interpretation and whether an old still photo could be easily modeled or if it needs manual creativity to craft. So maybe that's a, that's a question for the colleagues of uh, Mateus at Actor, I guess. Yeah, yeah. That's a, a very good question because it's also the the main challenge in the, that work actually so uh, and it depends it really depends on the on the case uh, in some cases that we work on there is quite a lot of um, archive material there's quite a lot of uh, also findings um, and, and then a good base on which we can build on um, and in other cases of course it's, it's much less of that um, and, and uh, we have to create more hypotheses. Um, usually, we try to in the model, we try to uh, distinguish. Between Sorry, Matthias, we have it. You're coming in and out. I don't know if it's the position of the microphone. Mm, I don't know. Yeah, maybe that's better. Yeah. Um, in uh, in the cases where we don't have uh, inform or in all the cases, basically, we try to distinguish between uh, what is uh, reconstructed uh, based on the, let's say, more uh, plausible um, plausible grounds, and what is more, let's say, uh, a, hy a hypothesis or just a uh, yeah a thought of how it might uh, look like. Um, and this is it really depends on the case. Uh, usually, for the newer uh, buildings, it's much easier. Uh, if you remember, I was showing uh, a 3D reconstructed rotating furnace uh, from the mine. Uh, in that case, we actually had also uh, plans, uh, technical drawings of how it was built. And we just had to, in a way, check if the technical drawings were actually implemented uh, as they were drawn, uh, because usually uh, when they were being built, they did not really respect the, the, the technical drawings uh, to, in, in all the details. So, and then this is a uh, much easier case than in some other cases where, of course, we don't have much material. I think that the important thing is that when we um, show this to, uh, to audiences, when we, when we interpret this to different audiences, that we really tell and we really indicate um, what is uh likely and what is let's say less likely what is just uh, uh just the assumption thank you mateus thank you thank you are there any other questions also from the chat if um i could read just the next question um it was something related to the presentation of uh, the colleagues from the University of Lisbon. And, um, and the person was wondering if we could uh, test those software capabilities for applications such as human ergonomic monitoring in the manufacturing field. So very specific question and an interesting one because it looks at a different, completely different field of application of uh, such a tool. So maybe I give the, uh, the the floor to, um, I don't know, Rui or uh, Carla. Yes, I saw the question as well. Thank you, Alex. Yes, maybe Rui can answer better than me, but I, but I, I can just tell you for the, at the moment that we have, since the moment when we started developing this first prototype, as I told you, this uh, creation tool many years ago, um, it was, we, we had requests from people, most of all from sports, anthropology, 
journalism, um, actually children education. And, and this is a totally different area that I haven't been yet approached from, I mean, industry wise. So I, I mean, I think we need some time in the, in the sense that we, now we have not a prototype anymore, but a better version. At the end of the motion notes, it will be a ready product, but then, later on uh, we can start talking with other with other people but at the moment i can only imagine that uh, this could be may maybe useful for you know when you're uh, testing the, the 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 functionality of of uh, of a product so when you need to note details of uh, let's say a new kettle or whatever new product that you need to specifically want to change the shape of, or maybe Stefan and Rui can think with me here, but uh, lot, uh, when it comes to video annotation, it can actually be applied to everything where there is any kind of movement involved. And, um, yeah, yeah, Carlo. Uh, I I'll, uh, also don't have a straight, a straight answer to that particular case, but um, uh, I can say that uh, many, many areas, the, the area that I'm working on right now it's in the education uh, people that I know are using uh, motion notes um, in the education in classrooms uh, trying to uh, give another dynamic to the classes with videos and the notations and share the video with the students later uh, so uh, also um, yeah I think Carla mentioned the other cases in sports and so on so uh, I think it's worth trying it uh, if you have a test case to do it it's for free so um just let us know if uh, it worked or not or if you need another uh, features that we are working right now on motion notes you can develop in the new ideas so you wait, we are open to suggestions i don't know if stefan want to add something yeah, I think you've responded really well, Carla and Rui. Uh, there is another aspect which Matthäus brought up in his uh, presentation, which is once um, like a um, tool exists, uh, how is it used? And who is it used by? And what are, let's say, the use cases and design requirements by the users and this is really interesting and that's why it's great to have the lab day uh, the possibility to engage with you um, because uh, obviously you start from a certain point which was movement in our case and it's evidently useful for dancers and and also for the performing arts in general uh, and then uh, I, I remember there were even people from football interested right. color right? Like right. in the very in the beginning. And now we know, like ten years later, we know that uh, the big football teams have video analysts and use video annotation uh, to to prepare for the next uh, uh, adversary. So it really depends on what uh, how it is used and probably also how well it mm -hmm. is. Um, made known that these tools exist uh, because still today I find myself like teaching in a certain environment or working with a company on a piece and they don't know about motion nodes and then really? I have to I have to show them and they usually they're really excited they get really wow I had no idea and most of the choreographers still work with um, yeah with a normal notebook and their smart uh, their smartphone in that combination Right, so I think we'll have another five years uh, once the tools exist uh, to disseminate and to get um, people to play with it. Yeah, for sure. I actually re very recently I had a, a tennis teacher asking if that would be also uh, feasible uh, or useful, and I said, yeah, I think so, absolutely, because you know when you have to just detailed deta in a in a detailed way. Uh, explain exactly how you use the racket or how you put your foot on the ground specifically when you turn so well in, in any actually context where there is need to um to be precise regarding um human movement or of course ergonomic uh, functions would be the same yeah, so i'm really glad for, for your interest i see a question for stefan 
It says, um, after we export the Motion Notes project, oh, um, can we use the file in other software? I see your project file consists of video we upload to uh, JSON. This is a very technical question. <laughs> I, think, I think that's for Hui. That's not yeah, for yeah, me. Oh, is it for Hui? Okay. Yeah. It, it's for me. Uh, yeah, right now it's only possible to import. Uh, uh, regardless, the, the JSON format is a universal format, as we know. Um, the, the content in the JSON uh, file, it's, um, it's uh, copulated with motion nodes. So right now it's not possible, but we have uh, future developments planned to um okay and yeah we should maybe we should just also mention that in, indeed we we have just i mean development in terms of your your side of uh, uh, real um, computational um, programming it's still very in this new project it's still very short so it takes a, a long time it's a tough it's a tough job so We've uh, we really hope that by November we have already a more stable version. But then towards the end of the project, yeah, we'll do our best. Please. Yes, and thank you. And we are coming towards the end of our lab day. Um, this is the first of many lab days to come. Um, we thank you for joining us, for asking your questions, for contributing to the Padlet and for just engaging with the material. There will be more opportunities to engage with the tools, with the content. Um, but before we go, please don't go yet. I would like to have run the last poll just so we can kind of get a sense of before and after of the lab day. And do feel free to reach out to us, um, drop your email in the chat or email myself or anyone on the team and we will definitely see how we can continue to connect the dots and work together. Um, you have two questions there. Please do take 10 seconds to answer. I will put the Weave website link into the chat for you with information on our we have various lab days, which will be looking, we have um, lab days with the Roma community on the culture of Portuguese, Portuguese folk dance, um, the Castelli, many, many, many things to come. Also starting next year, January, 2022, we have the capacity building strand of the lab days that are really looking at how and what kind of best practices are out there. So do feel free to join these and they will be online in many cases. So with that, thank you so much. If I can have our final slide as we all go off into our day, um, hopefully moving and dancing and looking up at the sky and looking at cultural heritage monuments. So thank you so much on behalf of um, the Weave team. Uh, thank you for everything. Thank you.